Uh, my name is Jeremy Nicholson, I'm director of the Energy Intensive Users Group, which represents large industrial electricity and gas consumers in this country, uh, the, the backbone of intensive um, heavy industry, if, if you like. Um, and so my, my talk's going to concentrate on the economic impact of wind power and the cost of subsidising it and accommodating it and backing it up in the way Dr. Mike Hall has just, just described from an engineering perspective, the cost of that on business bills as well as on the electricity that all of us are purchasing as domestic consumers. And, and we sometimes forget in this argument, important low fuel poverty and the cost of living is to all of us as consumers, most electricity in this country is actually bought by businesses, or at least uh, non-domestic premises, it includes the public sector, small businesses, large businesses, energy intensive and other, other manufacturing outfits. So uh, um, it, energy is crucial for all aspects of the economy and if we're going to compete in an increasingly globalised world, um, we need to be competitive. And so that's the thing that concerns me most about the wind agenda, what it's going to do to the competitiveness uh, of our economy. Uh, just for, by way of introduction, the uh, energy intensive sectors in this country, um, I'm saying country singular at the moment, uh, maybe, maybe there'll, be, there'll, be, there'll be two after a certain, certain date, who knows, um, but Britain as a whole uh, includes steel making, chemicals, uh, paper, aluminium production, glass, ceramics and so on, lime and cement, all of them intensely energy, energy intensive and for, for of which the security of those energy supplies and the price here compared with elsewhere determines whether the investment and the jobs come here as well. And although there's not much uh, uh, steel making, or virtually no steel, steel making left north of the border following the closure a number of years ago of the Ravens Craig plant, uh, we do still have um, some aluminium smelting here at Lock Harbour. Uh, none left in England and Wales following recent closures, sadly, and a, a considerable chemical sector, not least at Grangemouth, which has been in the news for other reasons recently. And the paper industry, which is very energy intensive itself, about 40% of the UK's paper industry is located north of the border. Um, access to forestry and, and for paper and pulp is critical for that industry. And just to put some numbers on it, there are 160,000 jobs directly employed in energy intensive industries in this country and about 800,000 jobs um, dependent um, across the UK on, on that manufacturing remaining. And people sometimes say, well, you know, the UK doesn't manufacture anything anymore. Well, it's certainly true, fewer people are employed in manufacturing. Um, but astonishingly, we, we remain, on GVA terms, the world's seventh largest manufacturer. And many of those industries, you think of automotive and aerospace and so on, hugely export oriented. Anyway, enough of an advertorial for, uh, uh, for, for British business. Um, let's start with a bit of history. I know it's fashionable to ignore history at the moment, <coughs> um, uh, but uh, in certain quarters. But to understand where you're going, you have to understand where you are, and you can't understand where you are unless you understand where you've come from. This chart may be a little difficult to see from the back, but the yellow bars show the proportion of all energy, that's heat, transport, and electricity that comes from renewables, or came from renewables rather than 2005, in each of the European member states. Uh, the second to right pair of charts shows the UK figures, and the one on the right shows the aggregate for the EU 27 as a whole. The red bars show the targets that each of those nations has signed up for, under a burden sharing agreement for renewable energy by 2020. It's a legally binding target, but we don't actually quite know what legally binding means if we fail to hit it. And given that the costs of attempting to meet this target are approximately £110 billion for the UK, I think the European Commission would have to find us rather a lot for us to be any worse off for by not meeting the target. Um, you, you can see just about, of the UK uh, figures second to the right, there's a tiny little yellow uh, a tr uh, bar at the, bo at the bottom that shows that, with the exception, I think, of, of Malta and, and Luxembourg, we had the lowest proportion of our energy coming from renewables anywhere in Europe. And there's some good geographical reasons for that. We have, um, you know, a, f a fair amount of hydro up here in Scotland, um, but the rest of the UK has not been well suited to it, and we haven't traditionally had much much biomass, and it's not necessarily the best place to site solar. So for all sorts of reasons, it's not been a big feature of our power supplies in the past. And the fact that we are sitting on an island of coal surrounded by gas is another reason why we haven't had to worry about it too much in the past either. 
but the distance between the amount of renewable energy we were using um, in 2005 and where we're going to need to be by 2020 to hit the renewable energy target, if it was technically achievable, that growth required in renewable energy in the UK is larger than in any other member state. We signed ourselves up to a bad deal. And we would need to go from 2% of our energy um, to 15% of our energy uh, by 2020. And, and nobody that I know that scientifically or technically or uh, from an engineering perspective literate uh, believes that's a technically feasible uh, target, even if we could afford it. And that's the thing that concerns me the most. And what does this mean for electricity? Well, there's a limit to what we can do with renewable energy in transport fuels and in heat. So that means most of the strain's got to be taken by electricity. And what is the, in quotes, um, most readily available source of renewable electricity to the UK? It's wind, with all the intermittency problems that we've heard about uh, before. So in order to hit this target, we would need to go from the current, I think it's around about um, it's, it's over 10% now, about 12% of our electricity coming from renewables on average. Uh, and that would need to rise to over 30% by 2020, with a bulk of that coming from wind. You imagine that, 30% of our electricity, most of that 30% coming from wind. On one day it might be a fraction of that, on another day it might be much more. And that's the intermittency problem we have to deal with. Um, by the way, the reason the UK signed up to that uh, renewable energy target was basically the result of a prime ministerial cock-up. Tony Blair, a few, months, a few weeks in fact, before he uh, uh, resigned as prime minister, effectively did a deal with, um, uh, with the Germans and others uh, that we would accept the, um, the renewable energy target and um, there were various other deals done on, on, on other things which I suspect were rather less beneficial to the UK than this was costly. And he did so against the advice of the relevant government department at the time. The old DTI uh, used to be in charge of energy policy. Now we have a separate en a ministry for energy and climate change. But in those days, the DTI was against a renewable target precisely because they knew how expensive and impractical it would be. Um, and it also did it against the advice of the chief scientific advisor at the time, Sir David King, who actually has rather outspoken views on climate change much more extreme than, than many would necessarily subscribe to in this room, um, but whose uh, uh, um, uh, commitment to the green agenda was hardly in doubt. So all the technical advice was against it, and he saddled this country with a £110 billion bill as a result. The context, by the way, of what we're facing in terms of the sh potential shortage of supply, it's, it's not a good idea to um, be scaremongering about the threat of blackouts, but as um, M Michael also explained, the increased risk of a power shortage is very real. And what this means when you have a market for electricity is that costs are going to be higher. Um, generators and suppliers will be charging a premium um, in order to cover that risk. And there is a, there is a very real risk, if, if, if there are physical shortages, that it will be industrial consumers of the sort that I work for um, who will be most at risk of losing their supplies. Um, this particular chart came from an off-gen report a couple of years ago. Uh, there have been updates to it which are very, very similar, including the uh, winter outlet report over the month or so from National Grid, and they all show similar curves. The central curve in red shows what's happening to the supply margin. The margin of spare dispatchable capacity <coughs> on, on the system compared with demand. Um, coming down from you know, just under 15% at the moment in the base case, to a much lower figure of less than 5%. And what does that mean? It means if we get power failures or a surge in demand, we could be short. The lines above and below, by the way, show the effect of imports or exports or absence of imports from interconnectors from France and the Netherlands and so on. Um, we rely on a couple of gigawatts of imported largely nuclear power from France in peak conditions. What happens if, for whatever reason, it's not there? What happens if there's cold weather across Europe and Northwest Europe, which is quite frequent during winter time, the blocking highs that result in low wind speeds, not just all over the British Isles, but all over the rest of Europe. In such circumstances, France, Germany, and other countries will be having very low wind output too. They'll be having very high demand for electricity. And if there are any plant failures in, in the continental markets or, or disruptions to transmission, that has implications for our supply. And there are plausible scenarios where our supply margin goes down to zero which effectively means either blackouts or enforced curtailment of demand, which amounts to much the same thing in British, in British industry. So 
the, the ministers are right when they go on TV and they say it's a very unlikely, close to it, close to impossible that the lights will go out. I'm not w worried about the lights going out because in the first instance it's, being, it's chunks of British industry being closed down so that the lights don't go out that I'm most worried about or indeed in certain price sensitive cases industries not even being able to afford the power they need to stay in business. That's one way of balancing the system, but it strikes me that it's not terribly economically sustainable to balance it by shutting down the one part of the economy that's supposed to be making money, and by the way, isn't dependent on subsidies. Um, the Chancellor has been saying some sensible things about the cost of climate policies, but unfortunately, just after the coalition government was um, elected, Treasury came up with this wonderful idea of a carbon price floor, which is not directly a renewable subsidy, but it has the effect of generating windfall profits for existing wind farm operators and indeed uh, uh, existing nuclear operators too. This chart shows the Treasury's own expectation of what's going to happen to electricity prices, partly as a result of uh, the carbon price floor and other uh, 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 green policy measures to subsidise renewables and so on. Uh, the purpose of this chart, by the way, is apparently to make you feel better about government policy. And looking at the fact that it starts at one level and ends up considerably higher by the end of the chart, going off to 2030, you might wonder where the good news is. Well, if you look very carefully, there's a spread of numbers on the right-hand end in, in different scenarios. You, you can, you can uh, uh, avoid worrying about the detail. Uh, the scenario in which we pay more between now and approximately halfway through the next decade means that we might conceivably pay slightly less between 2025 and 2030 as a result, according to the government's own computations. Well, I don't know about your view of that future, but certainly as far as British industry is concerned, surviving between now and 2025 is a higher priority than getting marginally less, more expensive, that doesn't sound contradictory, uh, electricity uh, between 2025 and 2030. And I would have to guess that not necessarily everyone in this room might necessarily be around to benefit from the theoretically less expensive prices at the tail end of the next decade. Anyway, this is a lot of evidence that, got, that the government has been putting out apparently is good news to reassure consumers they're on their side. I have to say it's had the opposite effect with our members. And I mention it because this carbon price floor is another indirect way of subsidising renewables that is not itemised on your bill, but we are all already paying for. Um, and as Mike has mentioned, we're going to need a considerable quantity of backup electricity. This is an earlier estimate from National Grid, current estimates are, are fairly similar, in order to uh, accommodate the intermittency of wind and to a lesser degree solar on our system. And this is indicative uh, quantities of short term operating reserve from around a gigawatt um, or gigawatt and a half at present to over five gigawatts by the end of the decade. Were we to hit our green targets? That all has to be paid for. Having expensive plants operated intermittently as backup has to be paid for. Yes, every hour that wind is generating, every kilowatt hour it generates, is a kilowatt hour that doesn't have to be generated from fossil fuels. But the capacity to provide that backup has to be there, and indeed the efficiency of plants that are operating intermittently, intermittently for backup is compromised as well, so their specific fuel consumption and emissions are higher. And how can it make any sense from an environmental point of view, by the way, as we're in Scotland, okay, at the moment, Scotland benefits from the relatively reliable low carbon output from Torness and Hunterston. But rather like the German situation, how can it make any sense to close down on the largest and the most secure source of low carbon generation and replace it with an intermittent source that needs fossil fuels to back it up? This makes no sense from an economic or an environmental point of view. Um, and that's assuming that you think that the climate problem is one that can necessarily be solved by unilateral action to reduce emissions in this country and elsewhere. Quick word on gas prices. All of this would be a bit easier to accommodate when our gas price is not so high. I won't dwell on this and, and the whole question of shale gas fracking. Suffice to say that both in the UK and some other parts of Europe, we have considerable resources here. They may be more expensive to exploit than in the United States, but whether we use gas as a baseload generating fuel um, or continue using it for heat and in industry too, or as a feedstock for the chemical industry, um, or indeed as backup for wind, we're going to carry on needing gas supplies here, and if we're importing it in LNG from the Middle East or from Russia, uh, across Europe, um, that's going to be relatively expensive. The top line in red shows Russian oil index prices in Europe over the next two years. The blue line, which is higher in winter, lower in summer, represents the forward UK gas price.
Um, on average, by the way, our retail <coughs> gas prices are slightly cheaper than anywhere else in Europe at the moment, not that it feels like it. But what really matters is what's happening internationally. Where's the investment going? The investment in steel production, chemicals and so on is going to America and developing countries, not because they've got low wages, but because they've got competitive energy prices. And by the way, America is reducing its CO2 emissions by substituting cleaner gas for coal at no net cost to the consumer. And not because of climate policy, but because of simple economics. They've got access to cheap gas. We ought to be doing the same here, irrespective of what renewables we have on top. The next chart may be a little difficult to see, but it came from a report produced by the Business Department this last year. Uh, the blue lines show um, the cost of industrial electricity in various parts of the world right now, and the, the coloured lines on the top represent the influence of uh, climate policies, such as the climate change levy, the renewables obligations, subsidised wind, the small-scale feed-in tariff that subsidises domestic solar and so on, and various carbon costs in, in, in other European countries. And the first thing you can see is there's quite a big difference at the moment. The UK is the, is the, is the bar on the right, so it's amongst the most expensive, but not the worst. Um, you can see that uh, third from the left is the Japanese one. The reason Japanese prices are so high is after the tsunami and the, the knockout of the nuclear uh, fleet there, obviously their, their prices have spiked for reasons that have got nothing to do with climate policy. But we already have amongst the highest electricity prices in, 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 in Europe, and with a big chunk, around 20% of that, being attributable to climate policy. So that's making our competitive situation worse. But the real question is, what's going to happen by the end of the decade? And this, according to the government's own analysis, is going to make matters worse. Again, it's a little tricky to see from the back. The UK figures are on the right. There are three bars there that are showing the cost, the add-on costs above the natural price of electricity um, in 2011, in 2015, and the one on the right is 2020. So we're going to be adding around 30 pounds a megawatt hour to industrial electricity prices by the end of this decade. And the wholesale price of electricity at the moment is what, about 45, um, maybe even 50 pounds a megawatt hour. So we're going to add on a massive chunk uh, of add-on costs that won't be faced by our competitors within Europe, let alone those outside. How is UK industry supposed to compete with that? Um, incidentally, the, the purple line on there represents, um, that is the renewable energy cost. So some of those costs are carbon pricing, but most of the cost is subsidising renewable energy. And as we know, most of that renewable energy subsidy goes to wind. So when people tell you, oh, this is actually going to save money for consumers in the long run, no, it isn't. It's going to cost us more in the long run, according to the government's own analysis. <coughs> Percentage figures are slightly different for the domestic sector, but these costs are going to appear on your, or within your bills as well. The one thing I think has been really lacking, and that the, the energy companies could do more on, um, and indeed would have done had the government not wished to disguise it, is to be transparent about the costs of this on your, on your bills. Guess what? The politicians were happy to do green grandstanding, say, my target's bigger than yours. What they weren't happy about was transparency about the impact on bills. So. Uh, what do the Committee on Climate Change have to say about this? Not naturally one of our allies, in fact they're all anti-industrial in many ways, but their analysis confirms the same thing. We're looking at a you know, 20 to 30 pounds a megawatt hour increase, the uplift of 20% already in industrial electricity prices will go up to, 20, to, to about 50 to 60% impact by 2020 as a result of these policies. The bar on the left shows the 2011 electricity price, the red bit being the underlying price, the coloured bits being above being the add-on costs um, for, for green measures. And um, their, their analysis shows that by 2020, again, the same thing. And it's the uh, renewables cost, the green bar, that is the single largest add-on cost. Now, you'll have seen in the newspapers the expectation that the Chancellor may have something to say in his autumn statement in a week or two um, about taking some of the costs off domestic consumers for subsidising electricity and, and gas energy efficiency measures. Um, maybe it's a good thing that's funded through general taxation rather than on bills, but there is as yet nothing in terms of protection for industry or domestic consumers from the mounting annually escalating costs of the renewables obligation. Now the one thing that um, the, the, the Treasury has done is it's imposed what it calls a levy control framework on the Department of Energy and Climate Change. And recently the um, 
And that limits the amount to which uh, debt can impose costs through suppliers, all, all of us that are inflating our bills. Um, these figures come from a, a, a publication earlier this in June this year on the draft levy control frame, so on the levy control frame, uh, and the draft contract for difference prices, the strike prices that are going to be available under long-term contracts uh, for, for renewables um, uh, uh, towards the tail end of this decade. Similar to the strike prices that have been offered for nuclear, which also generates a lot of headlines. And you can see that, you know, that, that the, the one sort of dispatchable renewable that's in there, biomass conversion at £105 a megawatt hour, is already double the wholesale price of electricity. Offshore wind is getting £155 a megawatt hour, going down to 135 by 2020, or 2019 rather, compared with the £45 or so for um, wholesale power at the moment. But as Mike has explained, that's not really the true cost of, um, of wind energy, because you have to also factor in increased transmission and distribution and balancing costs. So that's the price that a wind developer will get for generating a unit of power, whether it's needed or not, whether the transmission and distribution systems can accommodate it, and whether or not there are additional balancing costs that are being passed on. So don't think that will be the end of the cost. It's more offshore wall wind is more than three times expensive, and onshore wind is more than double the cost. Uh, these, these prices, horrific though they are, don't tell the full story. At least with nuclear at um, 89 to 93 pounds a megawatt hour, depending on whether size well B gets, size well C rather, gets built as well as Hinkley, uh, Hinkley Point. Um, at least with those prices, you're getting a guaranteed 24-7 power supply. With wind you're getting an intermittent one as the charts uh, we saw earlier demonstrate and something else has to fill in the gap. So the net effect on bills will be, uh, will be even larger. But also contained in, in there was an indicative, they don't say it's a forecast, an indicative figure for deployment in terms of gigawatts uh, by the end of the decade. And you can see that the government's talking about having 8, eight to 16 gigawatts of offshore wind, this is around, just around about 4 gigawatts at the moment. And God help us, 9 to 12 gigawatts of onshore wind. I can't remember what the onshore wind figures up, up to at the moment, but I, I imagine it's sort of around about 4 or 5 gigawatts or, something, or thereabouts. So we're talking about, in the, in, the, in, in the lowest case, almost doubling onshore wind capacity from now uh, to six years' time, and possibly more than tripling it. These figures, by the way, were attacked by the wind industry. Industry is not being large enough and being a great disappointment. I imagine people here might take a rather different view. Uh, but even, even if you are, in quotes, only adding another four or five gigawatts of onshore wind by 2020, I think the expectation is, to put it mildly, not all of that is going to be in suitable places, and all of it will come at a cost to the consumer. So, uh, what is the cost to the consumer? Well, um, those, that's an indication of the strike prices I showed earlier. Uh, compared with the current wholesale price. And if you imagine the effect of that, it's one thing having 5 or 10% of your bill being driven by, by these prices. Imagine if we are actually at the levels of deployment that DEC imagines, where potentially 30% of your bill or more um, could be driven by these prices at a multiple of our, of our current wholesale price. At a time when the supply demand balance is closing and peak power prices are going to go up anyway. This, this is a monstrous set of circumstances for the consumer. Um, I can't help feeling it's, it's, it's deja vu. It's, it's a bit like um, when the uh, former Chancellor Exchequer, uh, Ken Clark, introduced the fuel tax escalator on, on road fuels. And uh, this was cheered by both sides of the house at the time. Oil was $15 a barrel. Nobody seemed terribly worried about it. Uh, well, you know, we will pay our bit for the environment. Well, guess what? Um, as soon as oil surged in, in cost, those extra costs became intolerable, and the consumer finally realised that most of what they were putting in their tank was tax and not petrol. That's where we're heading with electricity at the moment. That's where they've got to in Germany, where they've exempted energy intensive uses for many of the costs, but everyone else is paying more as a result. And in Germany right now, we're heading to where we're going to be in 2020 in this country. Half the cost, actually slightly more than half the cost now, to a German domestic electricity consumer is green green levies and add-on costs, not the price of, of, of the underlying electricity at all. And this, is a, this is a big problem. I would suggest it's a politically and economically unsustainable one. So some more frightening figures to end up with. Um, this is an illustration of what 
uh, deck is allowed to impose on the uh, on the energy industry, and I, I can see the, the pen hovering. So I imagine I'm going to be uh, called to order very very shortly. But uh, well, as I am called to order, uh, I'll leave you with this horrific thought. Um, currently, about two billion pounds per year of subsidy, largely through renewables obligations, some through small scale feed-in tariffs and other measures, is supporting wind um, development in this country. Um, those costs uh, to all renewables are going to, and other green measures are going to rise to four billion by 2015-16, and they're going to carry on rising, according to the government's own estimates until 2020-2021. By the way, these cost estimates exclude things like the capacity mechanism that's being brought in to subsidise um, uh, uh, intermittently operated backup plant. So the total cost is going to be more. So this cost at the moment is going to escalate. Consumers are going to be subsidising green energy to the, to the tune of £7.5 billion pounds per annum. Now the government's right. Bill increases to date historically have had more to do with fossil fuel prices than green levies. But in the future, their own figures show it's going to be the opposite. And it's the green agenda. And the energy companies, it's not my job to agree with the energy companies, it's my job to criticise them if I think they're doing a bad job. But they're right when they say this is a major increase reason why the bills are going to have to go up. Of course they are. And by the way, the transmission and distribution costs will go up too. No one can expect National Grid to... Uh, to reinforce and extend onshore and offshore transmission lines and the distribution companies to reinforce theirs to accommodate distributed renewables without there being a cost to. And they'll have to make a profit on that if they're able to make the investment. So of course their profits are going to go, go up to. That was inevitable. If you don't like that, don't blame the companies, blame the government. One concluding remark, because I was uh, uh, enjoying a short walk here from a hotel around the corner this morning, uh, walking through, uh, through the, through the uh, the uh, frosty streets, uh, walking past the uh, statue of Campbell Bannerman uh, up the hill, I was reminded of a, of a time when the old Liberal Party actually supported classical liberal economics and uh, competition, uh, didn't like natural monopolies or central planning, although I uh, acknowledge as a role for strategic planning on, on energy, um, and, and famously in the previous century made its name by, by supporting the, the totemic issue of the repeal of the Corn Laws. And, and other people have made this, this comparison too. We've created a situation in this country where we are transferring wealth on a multi-billion per annum basis from the many to the few in the domestic sector and from industry that has to compete internationally and provide all the revenue that pays for everything else, again, uh, to, to wind farm developers and manufacturers of those components that are largely based outside the UK. In what rational world does that make any sense at all? And why is it that we've created this, you know, electrical version of the corn laws in the 21st century when we're hobbling our own economy, compromising our competitiveness and damaging the interests of consumers? So I don't think wind's the only issue in this, but it's the biggest single component of a cost in the biggest single element of increase that's going to be faced by electricity consumers. It can't solve the security of supply problem. It's only going to contribute to higher bills. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, as someone who doesn't take a pro or anti uh, a view on win per se. Good luck with your campaign here. I don't see why uh, uh, why the consumers should be footing the bill for this for decades to come, and I don't see why Scotland should be disproportionately affected with the with the environmental impact either of the wind farms or the transmission and distribution lines that will necessarily be required to uh, connect them up. And good luck with your campaign on this. You have a lot of us in industry behind you. Thank you.